Our next speaker, one of the most influential economists of the age, and even better, one of the best women economists of the age. She's on the board of Seagate Technology, Barclays Bank, SAB Miller, the global brewer, Barrick Gold, a global mining company. She is named as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. That's not just influential women, it's 100 people in the world by Time magazine. She was awarded in 2013 the Hayek Lifetime Achievement Award. I have been trying to get her as a counselor to One Young World for six years. Here's the seventh year and she's here. Please welcome Dambisa Moyo. Oh gosh, you can actually hear me. I was about to say something really bad. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I am here to talk about income inequality. And I'm going to warn you up front that this is a very, very depressing subject. However, before I launch into this very depressing subject, I want to assure you that at the end of this talk, we will end up with some solutions, some calls to action for us to be able to go and think about how we can fight this horrendous trend that has been going on for about 30 years. In 2016, this year, January 2016, Oxfam put out a report which was incredibly damning. They noted that the 62 wealthiest people in the world, just 62 people, have the equal amount of wealth as the bottom 50% of the rest of the world. 62 people versus 50% of the rest of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I read this and I thought this is outrageous. Not because I don't think that people who invest and save should not see benefit, but I did think that the skew between the richest and the poorest in our society has become one of the biggest issues that we need to focus on. What I will be doing today is I'm going to explain to you why this issue of income inequality has come from virtually nowhere 10, 20 years ago into becoming one of the most important and he most heated debate, uh, hotly debated issues of public policy today. To such an extent, that on most policy agendas around the world, this is in the top three items. And of course, we know it's also become a very hot, hotly debated issue in the US presidential election. But the reason this issue has come from nowhere to becoming one of the most important issues is because there are at least four reasons that the issue of income inequality is incredibly complicated. And I'm going to walk you through why the debate is complicated, but I'm also, as I promised you, will come up with some suggestions for how we should think about trying to redress the situation. In terms of income inequality, and before I tell you about these four aspects, one of the things we should think about is, why should we care? Why should we care about income inequality? Well, I'll tell you, there are at least three reasons why we should care. One is that, Income inequality changes do affect our ability to be politically active. In fact, today in the United States, according to the New York Times, just 158 families contribute 50% of the political contributions to the political campaigns. Think about that. A country that has over 300 million people, just 158 families have enough influence to be able to contribute 50% of the political contributions. Of course, there's also the other issue that we should care about income inequality because that means our ability and people's ability to pay for social services, such as healthcare and education, is significantly impacted by being able to afford those types of public goods. In other words, if you are wealthier, the quality of education and the quality of health care that you're able to access is significantly higher than the average citizen on the world. And this actually should be another reason why we should care about income inequality. 
Of course, there are other reasons why we should care about income inequality, in case people in this room don't care about it. We should care about income inequality because according to the OECD, developed countries have lost approximately 8% of GDP over the last few decades because of income inequality differences. What that means for political unrest and instability is significant. The notion that one person can live in wealth and in comfort just 20 minutes away from somebody who's living in destitution is absurd. So we have to figure out what to do about income inequality. But as I mentioned, there are at least four things that complicate this discussion. Number one is the contrast between the United States and China. The United States is the largest economy in the world today in GDP terms. The estimate is that it's approximately $16 trillion economy. And as we know, its political stance has been one of democracy. Its economic stance has focused on market capitalism. The second largest economy in the world today is China. In fact, by some estimates, it may have already surpassed the United States in terms of its size. But for our purposes, we will assume that it's the second largest economy in the world with approximately $10 trillion of GDP. And as we know, it has got state capitalism, where the government is the arbiter of labor and capital. It's at the heart of the economy. And it has deprioritized democracy in terms of its political stance. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, so what? What does that have to do with income inequality? Well, these two economies, the number one and number two economies in the world, with completely different political systems and completely different economic systems, they have the same measure of income inequality. This is the Gini coefficient, measured at around 0.47. The Gini coefficient is just the ratio of the wealthiest to the poorest in the society. Think about that. I myself come from Africa. Do we have Africans in the house? That's right, fantastic. I will tell you though, that if I have been lucky enough, like many of you here, to travel to over 80 countries around the world. And when I travel to these countries, people say, we care about income inequality. Which model should we, should we choose? Should we pick the American model of democracy and free market capitalism? Or should we pick the Chinese model, which has started focused on state capitalism and deprioritized democracy? If we just look at income inequality, the evidence is not so clear. In fact, to make matters worse, the income inequality in the United States has worsened over the past 10, 10 years, and that income inequality in China has actually improved. Now, I'm not here to in any way suggest that we know the answer but I think this is an important piece of the puzzle to acknowledge that there is some complications in this debate of income inequality. The second problem with the income inequality debate is that we've actually tried two very different competing models to address income inequality. On the one hand, we've tried trickle-down economics. We've kept interest rates low in the 80s, and we actually have tried very desperately to try and encourage this uh, trickle-down supply-side economics where keeping taxes low, we thought that the wealthier in society would invest and therefore create jobs and that would improve people's living standards. Well, I'm afraid to tell you that did not work. Now, neither did the other side of tax and spend or tax and redistribution where governments raised taxes and actually redistributed money to the population. I'm afraid to say that also has not worked. In fact, if we use the United States as an example again, over the past 30 years, we have seen income inequality worsen and real wages deteriorate quite considerably, which has had a meaningful impact on worsening people's living standards and widening income inequality. So again, forgetting for a moment China, if we just look within public policy in the United States, which model do we choose? It is not clear because we have evidence from both sides of the equation to show that actually we've not been able to address the situation. The third issue that is complicating the income inequality debate is social mobility. 
Now, one of the questions that you should be thinking to yourself is, why is income inequality over only an issue in the last few years? Where was it all this time? Why was it not an issue before? Well, it really wasn't an issue before because we had social mobility. People were able to see their lives improve. And even if it wasn't their own lives, they could see the improvements in their families, their children, and their children's children. Well, unfortunately, social mobility has deteriorated quite significantly over the last 30 years. Now, again, I'm going to pick the US as an example, but only because the US is a large economy. Many other countries in the world are also experiencing the types of social mobility erosion that the US has experienced. For example, in just 30 years, we've seen that the probability of being born in the bottom 25%, but ending your life in the top 25% has gone down by 50%. People's ability to improve their livelihoods or even to see the improvements, potential improvements for their children and their children's and children has been meaningfully hurt. Now, one of the more subtle conversations that we need to think about as society is what do we care about? Do we care that we have a Steve Jobs who has meaningfully changed our lives? And therefore, should Steve Jobs be rewarded more than Dambisa Moyo? Because everybody, well, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people in this room have in their pockets or in their handbags a phone that Steve Jobs really created. That has transformed the world, how we communicate, how we transport ourselves. So should we reward him, recognizing that Steve Jobs can, has potentially changed and created so much GDP? for the world and has created jobs. Or, in which case, by the way, we should care about the relative income, saying, well, actually, Steve Jobs is too wealthy. He should be taxed and be on the same level as Dambi Samoyo. Is that fair? Or are we thinking as society that we want people to maintain a similar level, of minimum level of standard of living, which is fair in our society? By that, I mean, are there some unacceptable levels of living standards that we will not tolerate in society? In which case, we care more about the absolute minimum level of income inequality. The Steve Jobs versus Dambi Samoyo example is really about relative income inequality. Having a basic minimum standard of living for all of us around the world is about an absolute income level of income inequality. The question is, what should public policy target? What should we care about as society? Does it matter that some people, the 62 people I mentioned earlier that the Oxfam report, report mentioned, uh, referred to, does it matter? Do we feel uncomfortable that those 62 people have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 50%? Should we care? These are the societal questions we have to grapple with. The final point that I want to touch on, that's com complicating the debate, around income inequality is the fact that I believe that the defining challenge of our society today is the lack of economic growth. We do not have the amount of economic growth that can really meaningfully change people's lives. What do I mean? In order to double per capita incomes in one generation and meaningfully put a dent in poverty, we need these economies to grow at 7% a year. 90%, 90% of, of the world's population lives in the emerging world. I'm sure there are people from the emerging world here. I know there are a lot of Africans, but emerging world, yes? 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging world. The vast majority of those economies are growing far below the 7% number, that magic number that we need to double per capita incomes in one generation. Brazil, South Africa, Russia, India, all growing below 7% a year. Countries like Brazil are in recession. South Africa and Russia are talking about 1% to 2% growth a year. It's not just about developing countries, of course. Developed countries are also struggling to create economic growth. How can we actually improve people's living standards and meaningfully reduce poverty if we don't have economic growth?
Now, I was trained, I have a PhD in economics. Um, however, I'm also much more about living in the real world. And I think one of the questions we need to ask as a society is, are we perhaps focusing too much on GDP? Are there other ways of us assessing how we can value people's life and value improvements in society? Again, these are questions you need to think about. Is it good enough for me to just say we need to target 7% a year? Because clearly we're not able to do that. In the aftermath of the financial crisis, this is eight years on from the financial crisis, and we are really struggling as public policymakers and economists, as governments and politicians, even as business people, we are struggling to create economic growth and to provide opportunities for the next generation. We are worried about debt. We're worried about the changes in the demographics that we're seeing not just the fact that people are getting older in developed countries, but we're worried about the quality and the quantity of young people in the population. Are they actually getting access to opportunities? The OECD has put out a report that says that this generation of Americans, in the history of the country, for the first time, this generation of Americans will be less educated than any preceding generation in the past. This is damning. What kind of a society are we living in when we're under-investing in our population? McKinsey put out a report not too long ago saying the under-investment in quality of education in the United States, particularly for minorities, is so bad and so harmful for the economy, it will put the United States in a permanent recession. We are not doing the things that we need to do to ensure that we escape the income inequality trap. And yet, we have to do something before things get much worse. And that brings me to the solutions. I hope I've not depressed you in so much. I'm speaking to a group of young people, and it's really important that we understand where the challenges are that I've outlined for you. China and the US, tax and spend versus the uh, trickle down, issues around relative versus absolute, inequality and concerns about social mobility, the fact that we don't have economic growth, this is a real issue. But with that backdrop, where are the potential solutions? What should we be thinking about that might actually stem this tide? Before I outline a couple of ideas, I just want to remind you that the most important thing that you can do in this room but also when you disperse and go back to your homes, is to remain open-minded. I mentioned to you I'm from Africa. I was born and raised in a small country called Zambia. Are there Zambians here? Wow, yeah, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Zambians here, fantastic. Fantastic. This is the UN for the, the future. Much better than the UN. <laughs> Good one. I did say for the future, and I think my next speaker is from the UN, so she has to be next. <laughs> All right. Why am I telling you um, to remain open-minded and to be positive? Because in my country of Zambia, and unfortunately, to tell you the story, I have to tell you my age. I was born in 1969, which means, yes, I'm 47, for the people who are quick mathematicians in here. <laughs> Anyway, so, at the time of my birth, blacks were not given birth certificates. That law changed in my country in 1974. So to this day, I do not have a birth certificate. I have a letter, an affidavit from my government saying, this person, I wish I had brought it, that might have been a good slide to have. This person, we can... We agree, was born in Zambia, and this is the birth date. My birthday is February 2nd, so if you want to send me presents, send me presents. And it says explicitly, the reason we, she does not have a birth certificate is because at the time of her birth, blacks were not given birth certificates. The only ones that were given birth certificates, and it has a whole list of every, virtually every other race. Now, I'm not telling you that story to be negative. I'm telling you that story to remind you that in just 47 years, you can go from being born in a country as a girl 
in a landlocked small country, relatively small country, which has maybe about 15 million people, to being able to stand in front of an illustrious audience of 1,000 people in Ottawa. It's possible. It's possible. So we have to remain positive. We have to be open-minded and not get subsumed by negativity. People love to be negative. Do not get caught up in it. It is possible to come from the bowels of Africa to be standing here today with an education against the odds. You can do it. Of course you can. So the question is, what are we going to do about income inequality? And I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts. In the short term, and I'm going to give you short term and long term solutions. In the short term, we clearly have to do things that are going to stem the tide. People are suffering around the world. They are struggling to eke out a living. And it's not just about Africa and South America and Asia. Even in developed countries, people are struggling to eke out a living. And we cannot, as global citizens, just ignore that situation and pretend it's not our problem. It is our problem. It is our problem. Things like minimum wages and transfer payments may seem unpalatable, even for someone like me, who actually thinks that economies can run efficiently if we can do them properly and we can be honest and not be corrupt. But I do believe that in the short term, given how bad things are and the living standards that have deteriorated so much, we do have to consider those type of interventions in the short term. But longer term, and God willing, I'll be invited to come back, longer term, we have to invest in our futures. We cannot expect there to be engraved invitations from on high for people to say, here's a job with a huge income. That model is gone. It's gone. But we have to be the best versions of ourselves. We have to invest in ourselves and we have to care about improving ourselves on a regular basis. Education is critical. Look at the OECD PISA report, P-I-S-A. They test students in our, all our countries every three years in mathematics, in science, and in reading. We're doing a horrible job, a horrible job of ensuring that we see an improvement in living standards. We can start there. And most of all, we can rely on the fact that technology is providing a real opportunity for us to better the future, uh, the better world and millennials like yourselves. I can see people hovering around. It's just Kate. That's Sorry. my cue. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure having a chance to speak to you. I wish you so much luck. Stay positive, and I look forward to seeing you next time.